introduce Alegra de Loretis, professor of philosophy at Stony Brook University. She specializes in German 19th century philosophy and its relation to classical Greek thought, especially dealing around the conception and justification of what is a uh, right. Among other works, she has published the monograph, uh, Subject in the Ancient and Modern World on, he on Hegel's Theory of Subjectivity. And if you ever get lost while reading Hegel, you are certain to find their way, your way back with her Bloomsbury Companion to Hegel, which he co-edited in 2013. She has also edited the collections Hegel and Metaphysics on Logic and Ontology in the System and uh, Arbeiten zu Hegel und Verwandten Themen. That's my German, which basically <laughs> translates as works on uh, Hegel and related themes. That's what three years of German a uh, long time ago, I remember, <laughs> so very little. So fresh from the pressers is her Hegel's, and, uh, uh, her Hegel's anthropology, life and psyche and second nature. It was just published last August by Northwestern University, which also happens to be well, Northwestern University Press. Northwestern also happens to be Allegra Salma Mater. Her work as a fellow at the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook will allow her to complete her current manuscript, or allow her, on ethical implications of political economies. Today's talk comes from this body of work and its title commercialization of everything, or freedom of commerce, two historical views on civil society. So please join me in giving your warmest welcome to Professor Allegra de Laurentiis. We're very proud you're here today and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Adrian. Um, two things before I start. Uh, the first is that last Friday at the artists and authors reception that the Dean always organizes, um, President McKinney said something that really um, echoed with me. She was quoting Philip Roth, and um, I'm paraphrasing here. Eh? Um, and he said that in the in order to produce anything worthwhile in the humanities, you need essentially three things. First, silence. Secondly, relative isolation. And third, concentration or focus. This was such an unusual thing to hear from uh, a university president that I almost fell off my chair and I want to thank the Humanities Institute for having me provided with exactly those three things in the fall of 2020. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that when I wrote the abstract for today's paper, obviously I was far too ambitious. So I wanted to um, sort of summarize, etc. cetera, the, uh, the conceptions of civil or bourgeois society for two major figures of the history of modern philosophy. And there was no way of doing that, I realized four or five days ago in half an hour. So I'm sorry, but there will be no Hegel mentioned here at all. And my entire, I know it's a great, um, you know, it's actually very good, uh, but there will be exclusively Rousseau. And that's, plenty already. So I'll start right away. I have called this excerpt from one of my chapters, Bourgeois Society and Its Discontents. And I hope that I will know how to share my screen. Okay. Almost everybody here is familiar with certain lines from the mid 19th century manifesto of the Communist Party by which Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels describe the seismic impact of industrialization and capital accumulation on the peoples of feudal Europe. I'm trying to share, tell me if I'm sharing. Eh? Yes. 
And I quote without giving you the quote, this is something that everybody remembers maybe in the back of their mind. The bourgeoisie, they say, has put an end to all patriarchal idyllic relations. It has torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his quote unquote natural superiors and has left remaining no other relation than naked self-interest. It has turned personal worth into exchange value. And in the place of chartered freedoms, it has established a single freedom, free trade. All fixed, fast frozen relations are swept away. All new formed ones become obsolete before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. Uh, did I share this? Yes, I guess. There is some strange information here. Yes, you can see it. I, we can okay. see. This sweeping description, as striking as it was then, was not a new revelation. Its subject matter had been presaged, dreaded, and lamented for at least two centuries before that revolutionary year, uh, 1848. As early as 1611, for example, and now I can't, I, I need to share. Sharing is paused. Allow me for a second. Yeah, stop share and share again. Okay, thank you. Yes, this guy is the one I want. All right, so here he is. As early as 1611, for example, this gentleman, the English poet John Donne, Catholic turned Anglican, satirist, womanizer, denigrator of Jesuits, soldier, member of parliament, and father of 12, as far as we know, composes a fashionable coterie poem to mourn the untimely passing of one Elizabeth Drury, teenage daughter of his patron and all-round benefactor, Sir Robert Drury of Hostet. Uh, Rather quickly, the focus of the poem shifts away from the heartbreaking private occasion to a different kind of mourning about a more expansive loss, one that mirrors the rather ambitious title of the poem, namely, Anatomy of the World. Yes, wonderful. Here is a very, very short excerpt from an otherwise exceedingly verbose poem. And new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply and all relation. Prince, subject, father, son are things forgot for every man alone thinks he hath got to be a phoenix and that then can be none of that kind of which he is but he. No longer just grieving lovely Elizabeth's untimely demise, Dunn now appears to mourn the impending loss of a social world he has experienced, experienced as simple, transparent, and coherent into a world apparently descending into chaos. He frets about his contemporaries forsaking a life spent in naturally or socially dependable hierarchies, just like say the lifelong financial dependence of a prolific poet upon a powerful patron. Grief turns into grievance against the self-conceit of those whom a later expression would call self-made man. People who no longer understand themselves as members of one order, one rank, even one kind, but have fallen prey to the illusion of being born, every one of them, as a unique species unto itself. 140 years later, the most radical and influential of modern 
political thinkers, namely the Swiss Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and here he is. No, stop here. Why is that still there? Wait, he's in the back. I tried, wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'll do that again. Here is wonderful Rousseau. Well, anyway, it doesn't really matter. You probably know what he looked like. <laughs> he looked good. He was a very good looking fellow there. Um, done, done. Minimize the other one. Ah, okay. Yes, you're right. Minimize, not just stop. Here is Rousseau. Well, I have a better picture than you do, but that's all right. In a, in a wonderful Armenian garb. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau identifies the ills of the social world that Dunn could have only intuited in 1611 in words that would inflame generations to come. Madame de Stal, who was Rousseau's Geneva countrywoman, said it best. Rousseau invented nothing, but he set everything on fire. I disagree with Madame de Stal. I don't think it's true he invented nothing, but certainly it is true that he set everything on fire. Always in need of money, Rousseau used to submit essays in hopes of winning prize competitions issued by, uh, from the Academy of Dijon. The most extraordinary of his submissions did of course not win him the prize, needless to say. The illustrious committee found it impudent and scandalous what he was saying. He entitled it Discourse on the Origin and Foundations of Inequality Among Men. The essay begins by depicting the ways of life of a hypothetical long ago humanity, advancing through stages of a natural development, a progress that simultaneously and paradoxically also marks a disastrous regression. The result of this regressive progress or progressive regress, you can call it what you wish, spanning thousands of years is modern European society, whose description by Rousseau, I can only give here in truncated form. And you have it, uh, I have to share this now. Uh, give me a second. You have it in the handout. It's the first quote. Um, no, one second. Allow me, the quotes are important, so. There again, and now they're gone. Is that my quote? Yes. Okay. Quote one. Extreme inequality in our lifestyle, excessive idleness among some, excessive labor among others, the overly, overly refined food of the wealthy, the bad food of the poor, countless sorrows and afflictions, which perpetually gnaw away at souls. If it sounds familiar, it's because it is. Eventually, Rousseau discusses the universal degeneration, his word, of this part of humanity, which through self-incurred domestication has become, I quote, the weak, fearful and servile follower of an illusion. What illusion? The illusion lies in a faulty inference to which European civilization subscribes, namely, from having discovered that everyone has a right to, I quote, those things he thinks he needs, a right which goes well beyond the satisfaction of basic needs, everyone draws the conclusion that he is quote again, potentially the sole proprietor of the entire universe, quote end. We could call this, or I call this, for short, an acquisitive delusion. Such a widespread derangement, Rousseau argues, cannot be countered by words of persuasion. 
rather under penalty of this society's collapse, the universal acquisitive delusion must be countered by the imposition of enforceable laws that will do double service. First, these laws have to acknowledge a universal right to satisfying, quote, the multitude of passions which are the product of society. And second, these laws have to regulate the labor necessary to satisfy that right to satisfaction. <laughs> With that, Rousseau is formulating an imperative. The object of John Donne's prescient vision of an incoherent, delusionary, and destructive world of self-interested individuals, allegedly spawned by a misleading new philosophy, must be tamed. But Rousseau's direct experience and philosophical, that means conceptual grasp of this new world, shows its paradoxic, paradoxical nature. The delusionary independence of modern individuals is a cover-up for the universal dependency of each from all on a scale never before seen in history. The paradox is a bit along the lines of our recurring paradox when people speak of an individualistic mass society. You have to, to resolve that. <laughs> <laughs> to his unforgiving eye, our species' natural dependency on need satisfaction has now morphed into a dependency on endless artificial need satisfaction, a state of universal subjection in which everyone has become, he says, the slave of others, even in becoming their master. The quote continues, rich he needs their services, Poor, he needs their help, quote end. In this new constellation, everyone's being and appearance, être et paraître, have completely split apart. Human society has become an insane asylum of sorts, structured by the incessant effort of each to convince everyone else that they will find satisfaction only, quote, by working for his own profit, for them. In its trademark mixture of exact analysis and exasperated denunciation, the essay proceeds with an unforgettable portrayal of 18th century European society as a body politic riddled with hypocrisy and corruption, peopled by individuals ready to abuse others in hope of rising above them consumed by competitiveness, living in the perennial, I quote, hidden desire to profit at the expense of someone else, quote end. He was not in a very good mood when he wrote these things. Admittedly, Rousseau was, among many other things, a certifiable paranoiac, but no matter what we think of his French penchant for exaggeration, the fact is, that his portrayal of the origins and foundations of human inequality culminates with an extraordinary attack on, of all things, the very idea which would eventually give him undying fame, the idea of the social contract. Here's how he argues. In a pivotal and rather operatic passage, by the way, Rousseau was one of the premier opera composers of his time. So that, that explains in part the rhetoric in his, uh, the compelling rhetoric in his writings. Anyway, in this passage, he describes an imagined crowd of obtuse and cowardly enablers who still dwelling in the natural condition, one day allowed one from amongst themselves to proclaim exclusive access to a piece of land, whereby exclusive, of course, means a claim that deprives all others from any further claims to it. This is, in other words, the first claim to private property in a common good. For Rousseau, in this case, land in his little opera story, 
For Rousseau, it is this archetypal event and not Eva's tasting of the forbidden fruit that is the original sin, marking the beginning of humanity's fall. And if you don't mind following with me the second quote, he writes, the first one who, having enclosed a plot of land, conceived of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe it, was the true founder of civil society. What crimes, wars, murders, what miseries and horrors humankind could have been spared by one who, pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch, had cried out to his fellow men, Beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits belong to all and the earth is nobody's. This would be an excellent, the whole, <laughs> the whole discourse of Rousseau would be an excellent libretto idea for a Hamilton-like Broadway musical that will continue forever to be shown because it is so incredibly compelling. <laughs> well, anyway, the crimes and wars that followed this foundation of civil society then caused ever-increasing power inequalities as crimes and wars are wont to do, which in turn prompted the war of all against all as inequalities are also want to do. This cycle had to be stopped or mankind could not survive. Hence the mighty few tired of the constant attacks against their status and possessions attempted by the many excogitated a hoax of quite literally historic proportions. They extended to the powerless many an invitation so seductive as to be impossible to refuse. So to speak, an epoch-making mafia deal. In Rousseau's words, and here we must read the third, yes, the third quote. The rich, pressed by necessity, finally conceived the most thought-out project that ever entered the human mind. It was to use in his favor the very strength of those who attacked him to turn his adversaries into his defenders, a sort of martial arts trick. Let us unite, he said to them, to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and ensure that everyone has possession of what is his. Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform by subjecting equally the strong and the weak to mutual duties. In a word, let us gather our forces into one supreme power that governs us, that protects and defends all the members of the association, fends off common enemies and maintains us all in eternal concord. In other words, the unparalleled inequalities in wealth and power found in civil society originate, allegedly, according to Rousseau, in the juridical equalization of inequalities, an equalization rendered necessary to ensure the collective safety and flourishing of both the few and the many, the strong and the weak, the haves and the have-nots. And the political apparatus, apparatus, also called government, is being presented by the few to the rest of us like a neutral device that makes it possible for them all, in an ancient formulation by Plato, to sing the same song together. In Rousseau's story, the powerless but rest, ever restless majority <laughs> were all too easily seduced by the prospect of installing a master above themselves and above the powerful minority. And so Rousseau concludes, quote, they all ran to chain themselves in the belief that they secured their liberty. The upshot of the story is then that contractarian society is rooted in a stratagem that is as expedient as it is unequivocally fraudulent. 
and this is expressed in your quote number four. The social compact established forever the law of property and of inequality, changed adroit usurpation into an irrevocable right, and for the profit of a few, subjected the entire human race to labor, servitude, and misery. I must add here that even in the later social contract treaties that sealed Rousseau's fame as the father of all social contractarians, plenty of amendments and perspectival corrections in test and footnote, text and footnotes bear witness of his continued suspicion and skepticism toward the true function of the juridical framework established with the contract. In a footnote, that's the only one I'm gonna quote, he warns that under certain conditions, there, number five, under certain conditions, the talk of juridical equality serves to camouflage reality. Quote, under bad governments, juridical equality serves merely to maintain the poor man in his misery and the rich man in his usurpation. In reality, laws are always useful to those who have possessions and harmful to those who have nothing. Now, Rousseau was no proto-socialist by any stretch of the imagination, even if these things sound very much like he would be a Marxist ante literum, he was not. For him, equality never meant that everyone ought to enjoy an identical share in power nor in wealth. And that we said in parentheses, neither did it mean this for Marx, but that's for another chapter. It meant instead equality did, first that social and political power ought to be regulated by enforceable laws and quite draconian ones at that for Rousseau. Second, in regards to property, equality meant to him, and I quote, that no citizen should be so rich as to be able of buying another citizen and none so poor that he is forced to sell himself. Quote end. Now, obviously the conception of the deceitful character of the social contract and its juridical apparatus is not the aspect of Rousseau's philosophy that would resonate with the bourgeois and lapsed aristocrats who led the French Revolution a few years after his death. But it would play an immense, if often implicit role in various socialist revolutionary theories and movements of the 19th and 20th centuries. The ever perceptive Nietzsche, not a friend of any of this, not of the socialists, not of Rousseau, not of any of it, but yet very, very perceptive person felt obliged to state that, I quote him, in every socialist trembling and earthquake, it is always Rousseau's human being who moves, just, just like the old Typhon moved under the Etna. Oh, okay, this is vintage meat, very well said. What these vastly Diverse, diverse socialist movements had in common was first the repudiation of a right to the private acquisition of the common good, as in Rousseau's story, and second, a deep-seated distrust, sometimes unfortunately disparagement, of the juridical systems of the modern state. In 1894, the French novelist Anatole France summed this up in an ironic remark, <laughs> quote, in its majestic equality, the law, with a capital L, forbids rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges, beg in the streets, and steal loaves of bread. <laughs> the last work Rousseau bequeathed us is a diary, now entitled Reveries of the Solitary Walker, composed in relative solitude in the last two years of his life. This diary, divided in 10 walks or chapters, is in part a testimony to his progressive mental breakdown. A spiritual brew of self-awareness, paranoia, narcissism, self-pity, plenty of it, and sheer genius. 
punctuated by a wholly untenable, I think, type of misanthropy. Rousseau loves humanity to death, but cannot bear on any of its current specimens. I think several of us have had this kind of feelings lately, <laughs> but here it is. He is, that's what it is for him. In the society that he tried to make his home for all his life, Rousseau apparently found nothing but character masks, people completely defined by appearances, social functions, and social status. All the world's a stage. Sentiments, friendship, respect, compassion, not to mention highfalutin proclamations of universal liberty and commitments to equality and happiness for all. Everything is a fake for the old Rousseau. Looking back, Rousseau encountered lawyers, craftsmen, kings, highway robbers, profiteers, and members of the academy, but he never met with a human being, he says. This is allegedly because blind self-interest with its attendant compulsory lying and instrumentalization of others have spread like an infectious disease that undermines all human interactions. Rousseau has no explanation for this epidemic the explanations will be uh, attempted by others after him. He just notes its inevitability. To him, it is an un unspecified zeitgeist that operates as Adam Smith, Hegel, and Marx would later formulate behind the backs of all involved. What is most interesting in these last expressions of Rousseau's political thought, if we abstract from the obnubilation of his mind, which is quite obvious when you read them, is that he never falls for the naturalistic or idealistic fallacies that thrive then as they thrive today more than ever. By this I mean, by naturalistic and idealistic fallacy, that from his fierce analysis of the dehumanizing effects of civil or bourgeois society, he never concluded that this political system is either the fittest for human nature, the naturalistic fallacy, or an ideal arrangement for the future flourishing of humanity, the idealistic fallacy. Instead, Rousseau considers it just typical of a very specific historic formation one that precisely because it is a stage in human history is not forever, modern European society. So let me close uh, with this interesting quote from the ninth walk, the conclusion of another of his tirades against modern European manners, customs, and laws. And I hope everybody can read this. They say that in Holland, the people require payment to tell you the time and show you the way. Those must be a despicable people indeed who would thus traffic in the simplest duties of humanity. The poor Dutch, they're very nice people, but they were also really a commercial people par excellence, <laughs> the first and most successful ones in Europe. Then he continues, I have observed that it is in Europe alone that hospitality is sold. In all of Asia, they lodge you for nothing. I understand that one does not easily find all comforts there, but is it nothing to say to oneself, I am a human received among humans it is pure humanity which sets a table before me. Thank you. Let me. Well, thank you so much, Olegra, for an excellent and stimulating set of ideas in your talk. And uh, we are open for questions for you if you are willing to entertain them.
I am willing. Do I have a choice? <laughs> The sound? The sound. Down. No, no up. Up. So that we can hear the question. Ah, can I? Um, Adrian. Yes. She is my savior. Oh. But is it possible to raise the uh, the sound? Okay. Then I'll repeat the questions as I hear them. Thank you, Adrian. Any questions to Rousseau? Uh, yes, Peter Manning. Alexa, would you say something about uh, irony, not irony, of pure humanity which sets the table for me rather than thinking that the Chinese have a society which allows for this, but it is itself a cultural formation. Did you say the irony? Well, I, I'm asking oh. that, that it's so strange that, that everything you lay out, as you so lays out, is, is a historical formation. Yeah. And yet, here he comes upon something that another culture does, yeah. and he just says that's pure humanity as opposed to their cultural formation. So, Okay. Well, first of all, um, a bit of information of biographical information about Rousseau, because when he says in all of Asia, obviously he had not been in all of Asia, right? Okay. So, but Rousseau was very, very familiar with um, Middle Eastern. Um, cultures, not, not, not just the high culture, but really everyday culture, etc. through his extensive family relations in the Near East. Uh, his father had actually left him, poor guy. He was already an orphan of his mother, and then his father left too, so you can see why he eventually ended up being paranoid. But um, his father left him for uh, very lucrative commercial things in Istanbul and other places. And he had an, uh, an uncle who was something like an envoy of, I think, Venice, I'm not sure anymore, in Persia. And in any event, the that's, by the way, one of the reasons that he is depicted as wearing Armenian garb. And he actually introduced this kind of fashion at the time in his circles uh, because of this extensive familiarity he had with what he calls here Asian uh, um, customs. Now, what he means by this, I think, in, in his diary is that uh, a peculiar culture, namely the European culture of the 18th century, et cetera, et cetera, is such that it has overlaid the common humanity of people that goes well beyond, of course, Europe. It's the same as Asian, the same as African, the same as, uh, I don't know, in Timbuktu or so, okay, that they overlaid that with character masks with the overwhelming importance of status and then increasingly profession or social niche or whatever else you have, okay? Um, and therefore humanity had literally for him disappeared behind these character masks not so in other cultures, according to Rousseau. So European society was at the forefront of something, of a development that uh, he believed others had not yet, and maybe some others would never attain. So that's all I can tell you about it. Whether he, 
I don't think there is any irony here, by the way, on his part. He was too far gone when he was writing no, these things. Yeah. So that's really all I can yeah. figure out. Uh, Peter, Peter Caravetta. Yes. Ciao, Allegra. Wow. Good to see you. Likewise. Uh, one question about the last quote, uh, when he, uh, you actually uh, draw attention to it again about uh, the meaning of humanity, is in the, uh, I, I don't remember, in the original, does he use the expression l'humanité or l'homme, man? Because in terms of a recent uh, historiography, especially of the type that tries to debunk anything, you know, uh, anthropocentric, using the uh, expression, you know, man is the center of the universe, you know, the whole tradition, as opposed to humanity, which I take in my own work, I take it to have a, a different resonance. And I'm wondering if, uh, to what degree Rousseau would fall on the Vitruvian man, as opposed to, as you hinted at, by his sensibility, sensitivity to non-European cultures, whether he was actually concerned with, you know, not man, capital M, anthropos, but more like l'humanité, that is being with others, basically, your, your relationship to others, as opposed to the super ego, the transcendental ego, and so on. Do you see the difference between that and where would you put where would, what else can you say about Rousseau? I mean, how does he navigate that? Because it's, it's really, you know, the inception of the myth of, you know, man that commands, that uh, uh, masters the nature, that everything is in this idea of the anthropos that rules the world. I think I pick up, and now you make me, you make me want to go back and reread Rousseau, uh, that he was... Uh, uh, concerned with a broader, uh, maybe softer idea of being human. Can you elaborate on that in some way? Oh boy. Yes, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that uh, my talk um, spurred you into reading Rousseau again. I think everybody <laughs> should read Rousseau, whether they agree with him or not, I don't care. Right, right, it's right. wonderful. Okay. It's it's then, been 30 secondly, years, yeah. <laughs> secondly, I don't have the French text with me here, so and I'm not going to Google it right now, so I can't tell you. But he uses abundantly l'homme et l'humanité, depending upon the passage we're talking about. In this particular passage, I don't know, I don't remember. And thirdly, I have to say that I don't quite see how speaking of l'homme versus speaking of l'humanité uh, is, or which one of these is less or more anthropocentric. It's all anthropocentric. Uh, I don't really understand. I mean, I know that there are all the, these discussions, but even l'humanité is simply an abstract concept that refers to, as you said, uh, homme et femme uh, in relation to one another. That's what humanity is. It's a, you know, from a natural point of view, it's one human species. It's one species. It's an animal. Only it's an animal <laughs> with certain peculiarities, to say the least, okay? And um, it's a social animal. So why would that be more or less, I'm not sure, anthropocentric when it is used at the subject, major subject matter of a philosophical theory. That I don't know. Well, okay. Um, well, because actually I, I've been working on the fact that there is a, a there might be a, a slight difference. Uh, okay. One being a kind of a well-rounded concept, you know, man is, whereas l'humanité entails already a relationship of being human without stipulating that one is the center of the universe. The, the, the emphasis shifts on what you have in common and not what you have as a kind of a, either a, a platonic form or a transcendental you know, unity. 
Uh, yeah. No, no. Then, then uh, you understand. No, there is none of this in Rousseau. Okay. It's neither a platonic form nor is it a transcendental unity. By the way, the transcendental unity uh, does not have a particular sex or a particular animal species. I, I, I got that. I know. So let's leave that aside. But yeah, no, for Rousseau, there is no such thing. Of course not. There is physical man and there is moral man. It's still the same man. And it is one species that develops over time. And the important thing in Rousseau is that this development is a progressive regress <laughs> or a regressive progress, okay? And that I think makes him more interesting than, uh, you know, others when they reflect about where we come from and where we are going. But thanks, Peter, for this. This is an important aspect that you brought up for me. I have another question. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just make sure that there aren't others, though. Eh? Oh, okay. Let me, write, let, me write, let, let me write it. Uh, um, it well, it's then, all for you, Peter. Yeah, the, the, other, question, the other question is... Uh, been invited to write it down um, is the basic inequality built into the law something that has always been so or is it something that you show picks up first among his enlightened peers. Let me see. Uh, hold on. Okay, let me see if, uh, here we go. Is the basic inequality built into the law something that has always been so, or is it something that Rousseau picks up first among his enlightened peers? Build it up. No, okay. Um, there is no, it, it, it's the opposite. There is no inequality built into the law. The well, law, yeah. what is built into the law is an abstract equality that is then being applied to wholly unequal conditions. And that is his, at least in the second discourse, that is his radical uh, criticism of the juridical apparatus of the modern state. So there is not written anywhere in juridical systems of the modern state. Oh, by the way, if people are of that kind, uh, treat them differently than people of that kind or so. No, you won't find anything like that. <laughs> uh, the trick is exactly that inequalities are ignored by the law and that the law, the same one, just like Anatole France said, okay, is applied equally. So yes, you can, of course. A law that forbids you to sleep under the bridges of Paris is a law that is valid for everybody, okay? Except that if you have a home, not to mention a villa or so, uh, that's okay with you, okay? It's not a problem. And the only ones who will be actually affected by the law are the homeless. Are the what? So the homeless, <laughs> those who actually need bridges to sleep under. So this is the point that he is making. And the reason that I bring this up is of course, I mean, this is a snippet out of a much longer manuscript because in the end, uh, this became one of the most important aspects of the Marxian criticism of the juridical apparatus of capitalist society, okay? Pretending that we are all in the same condition and therefore right. applying the same law to everybody. but. I don't want to go into that because that would take another another 
I had a fellowship. <laughs> Adrian, did you hear me? <laughs> okay. Adrian raised his hand before. Yes, actually, my question was very much in line with your last comment, going back to your first quote of Marx of, you know, yeah. all that is solid melts into thin air, famous one, um, which clearly is, you know, beyond skepticism, it goes, uh, it goes beyond just yes, a criticism. And I was thinking about this you oscillation are, uh, in all the Adrian, that you, you are, have. You are not clear. Can you repeat? Okay. okay. I don't know if, I think my connection may not be good. Now it's good. Now it's better. Okay. So I was thinking about uh, the quotes that you showed us, that there's this uh, oscillation between the current state of things corrupts everybody. <laughs> it knows that the soul of everybody even the masters become slaves to the slaves, uh, become dependent on them. And at the same time, what you just said, the law benefits the, the better half or the, the ones that, uh, the owners, not the, yeah. uh, there. Yeah. Uh, so there is this thing about everybody is in this uh, society being corrupted. And at the same time, some groups get the benefit of mm -hmm. the current system, while others get. Uh, again, yes, their souls get not away and, and they don't get anything. So I was thinking in what ways, uh, you know, contrasting how uh, Marx would think that, you know, the, the proletariat would have some kind of a position of moral authority to stage uh, a revolution. Who would do that in the, in the, Rousseau, in the Rousseau, in Rousseauian uh, world? You know, it seems that there is no group that is uh, actually preserved any significant humanity from where to build anything. And that's my question. Who would, who would actually in this very well put critique, but who would be left to build a different alternative reality or a different alternative world, a juster one? Um, as far as Rousseau, he's obviously not thinking in terms of classes. He's thinking in terms of these two, the few and the many, which already you can find in uh, Plato and Aristotle. Um, he's thinking in terms of the rich and the poor. He never has a um, robust theory of how excessive wealth and excessive misery are actually conditioning one another. Why do they always come together? Okay, <laughs> he doesn't. Um, with regards to Marx, everybody knows that his idea was that in time, namely through a historical revolution, the class of the have-nots would not only take over the reins of power it would eliminate classes. So the telos, the, how do you say, the final end was classless society, at which point everybody has a say, if you will, okay? Um, there is, however, with regards to the issue of what will the law look like, in classless society, okay? Namely, if the law in class society uh, always damages the, uh, the have-nots and always privileges the uh, haves, as Rousseau says, and Marx would say, sure, I agree with this Rousseauian analysis, okay? What happens to the law in classless society? That's a good question. And there is actually a, um, what do you call it? A, a formulation that is very short and that is contained in uh, a, a, a writing by Marx, uh, the uh, 1875 critique of the Gotha program, which was the program of the social Democrats that he was criticizing, okay? And Marx takes this quote actually from another socialist. He doesn't even make it up, namely Louis Blanc. And the quote is like this. In classless society, 
um, let, let me just try to get this right. Yes, the law will ensure that it will be given to each, no, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Which means there are people with greater ability and people with greater needs. Not everybody is identical. And the function of the socialist state would consist in, uh, in, uh, um, in um, orienting, in, in, in sending the, um, the uh, resources of a society. They could be educational resources, financial resources, uh, physical resources, doesn't matter. The resources of society should go more to those who have greater needs than to those who have fewer needs. And at the same time, more labor, more effort, more work, more commitment would be expected from those with the highest, most maybe uh, sophisticated um, abilities. So that was the kind of rebalancing, okay, uh, that he had in mind, Marx did, okay, um, and that did not assume that everybody is absolutely the same as everybody else, or that wealth and power should be distributed equally, because that would be unjust. <laughs> you see, if I give the same piece of cake, the same amount of cake to those who already had 10 pieces and those who had none, that's unjust for Marx. That's not justice, the equality of everything, okay? It's the opposite of it. If I may, just as a comment, uh, what a sense, uh, and also reading the, the Emil and his autobiography, is that, uh, is that Rousseau uh, would actually think that those who, the, the, the haves and not the have-nots, would be in charge of transforming society somehow. Because the have-nots have been stolen from their humanity, their everything. Uh, and that's a big contrast with Marx, because Marx thinks that the have-nots have the moral and the experiential uh, knowledge that will allow them to move forward. So it's a, it's a huge uh, gap. I don't know if I'm right, but I was thinking in my head. Uh, I think you're right. There is a huge gap between them, and that's why only part of it was uh, actually, you know, part of Rousseau's thinking was extremely influential and the other part was not influential at all in the 19th and 20th century, okay? On the other hand, if you take the example of the, of the French revolutionaries, just a few, you know, whatever, a few years after he dies, 1778 or so, um, they subscribed very much to the idea that of the social contract and other things of that kind but they completely ignored the uh, criticism of it that I have tried to bring to the fore today. There is everything in Rousseau. You know, this person was so, uh, so self-contradictory, but in a really, uh, you almost, he had a universal mind in his own way, okay? That you can find, for example, I mean, he's the greatest propounder of democracy. And at the same time, he is the closest to a figure like Robespierre, for example. Okay. Um, you know, if in favor of democracy, if you have to cut heads, you will have heads roll from the guillotine. Now, Rousseau never says that but it can be actually derived from many things that are in the social contract, okay? And 
we tend not to notice these things because we are academics, we read books. But then when something happens, like Robespierre, okay, who is said to have carried with him the social contract in his uh, jacket all the time, okay, like other people carry the Bible or something, um, you know, then uh, we should not be super, we cannot be too surprised about how he, in the end, Robespierre, uh, decided to handle the issue of the Republic, of the French Republic. <laughs> And the same could be said for many others, but let's leave it to the historians to enlighten us about why from excellent theories uh, sometimes follow crimes by the thousands, if not millions. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you. Yeah. If nobody else has anything to say? <laughs> I think. Adrian, can we call it a day? Peter, which? Yeah. Oh, Peter, sorry. Well, I'm sorry, Bob. I mean, Bob you haven't asked anything. You go first. Go ahead. Who? Bob, uh, Bob Chris wants to ask the question, no? Oh. No, okay. No. Uh, um, I was just waving goodbye. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bye, Bob. Uh, to, uh, of the two, com commercialization of everything or freedom of commerce, uh, which way, I mean, if, if Rousseau sort of saw this as a kind of a, what is it, like a, a as, a, as an option, it's, it's an either or situation, or does he see um, is freedom of commerce something that would uh, uh, impair or stain or, uh, or somehow uh, intrude into the freedom uh, in the general sense of freedom of expression, freedom of movement? Uh, I mean, what I'm concerned with is like the, the idea that there is the law and then there is what the, uh, the individual citizen can do. And, you know, freedom of commerce was okay until it bumps into restrictions, into il divieto, the law. Um, how, I mean, you really, really put a bug in my head tonight. I'm going to spend the evening. Sorry. So, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. But could you say something more about just the two uh, word yeah. uh, uh, phrases in your title? Uh, which yeah. do you see Rousseau going? Okay, uh, bad title, because it suggests that there is a dilemma there, either right. freedom of commerce or com right. commercialization of everything. If I had had the time to present the Hegel version of all this, that would have made more sense. Okay. But it is not an, an, an alternative. Uh, Rousseau, uh, neither I think for Rousseau, nor certainly for Hegel, at least than anybody for Marx, the two things are separated from one another. Freedom of commerce, unless for Rousseau, it is uh, tamed by uh, draconian laws, is going to turn inevitably into the commercialization of everything. Okay, so in the, he didn't know that you can, for example, commerce in people's bodily organs. This idea had not occurred to him but he was clever enough, and every one of these ones was clever enough to foresee that sooner or later, the human body in bits and pieces, given the technology, etc., would become an object of commerce. Um, okay, and this is just a night, an example, because I could go on and besides, you know very well, what else is an object of commerce today? So we'll leave it at that, okay? For example, ideas, okay? Uh, you know, copyright stuff, etc. cetera. I, it's just, you know, it's all a matter of who gets the patent for what. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter who did the work. I, for example, am Rousseauian enough 
that I resent that every time I publish a you know book or whatever it is that I publish, okay, the uh, the publisher gets basically ninety nine comma ninety nine percent of the proceeding. Why? Why is that? <laughs> uh, there is no reason for that. I Revolution. Was, Revolution. <laughs> for ten years. And the state of New York pays my salary for 10 years, which means, which means, excuse me, uh, New York taxpayers has paid, have paid me for 10 years to write a book. Then it goes to Northwestern University Press, God bless them, okay? And that's it, basically. I have nothing from it, not that I want it, I don't need it. I'm happy with my salary, but I wanna say, when we talk about distribution and who is the owner of what and what gets commercialized, or not, this is just one example. By the way, Adrian, can I tell you, I am not, or rather Northwestern University is not my alma mater. I don't oh. know where you got that information from. I got I that because of the from. No, I don't have any American alma mater. I studied in uh, Russia and in Germany. That's fine. It's not. It's I saw not it. So I think it's very bad. Wonderful university. <laughs> I just. I might have read wrongly something. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's German universities and uh, lots of and, and Rome University of Rome. That was it. Yeah, that's my mistake. Sorry. Not, not a big deal. I just wanted to correct it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> one last observation, if no one else is asking well, questions. Last one, and there we go. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the note by uh, Rousseau about, you know, what is it, in Holland? That yeah. She was saying sarcastically that, you know, if you ask for the time of the day, somebody will, you, you know, you have to pay them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> It, uh, I recently there's been a discussion whether in New York City they should institute and bring back public toilets, mm. <laughs> which have disappeared, as you know, and uh, you can only use a public toilet if you go into a, a business, and then if you're not a customer, they say you you can do so. They're trying to they're discussing I think at the city council level whether we should reintroduce public toilets, but the big First question came up was, what? Well, not just who's going to pay for it. How much are we going to charge <laughs> to use public toilet? Yes, and yes, it's, uh, it's almost I feel like saying if you have to be charged <laughs> to take care of basic bodily <laughs> needs, okay. it's worse than being you know the Dutch who charge you for the weather. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it was I don't know which one is worse. But in any event, in both cases, as Rousseau says. It's the simplest duties of humanity. <laughs> and so he would be, I think if he was in the city council, he would be voting against charging people for of course, it. Of there, course. there might be very good pragmatic reasons to charge people. It's a, it's a poem, yeah. This is just not an area that I have been thinking about. I'll shut up. <laughs> Any further questions, or can you see in your in the room? Are there any? No, no more. Well, this, this might be a good time to uh, then thank you very much for your lecture and for your fellowship at the institute. Uh, you were.